Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been doing a deeper look at the 60 characteristics of complex trauma. So tonight, we come to value issues. Value is a huge thing within complex trauma. So let me start first by just giving a definition. And I want you to see that the term value actually has some multiple meanings, okay? So the first way we use values is in a value system or what we value as far as principles or standards of behavior. So here's a picture of that we value loyalty. We value equality, being honorable. We value teamwork, cooperation. We value justice. We value on and on. So it's the It's the behaviors, the attitudes, the principles that we see as things that cause success, that cause healthy, that cause happiness. Those are considered to be values. So we value it, okay? Then we value somebody or something that we see as beneficial, as beautiful, as helpful. We have a high opinion of them. So that's where we value somebody. And then thirdly, it's the inherent value we feel about ourselves. How much value do I feel I have? Now, having said that, it's important to understand that all of us come into the world with an inherent need to feel that we matter, that we have value. We have a need also to figure out what truly matters in life, what leads to happiness, what leads to success, what leads to good relationships. So those two drives are there. So we're seeking our own, what is my value, And what makes life work? That's what I want to value. So how does a child develop this understanding? What shapes how they value themselves? What shapes what they consider valuable in life? So there's a bunch of things I want you to think about. So again, every child longs Not just to be seen as having value, but to be validated. That people will pat them on the back. That people will say, you did a good job. I'm proud of you. That people will say, you're precious. You have great value. And so the people that are to be the primary givers of validation are the parents. And so that is where parents cause a child to figure out how valuable they are, okay? And how the parents validate them shapes what they think their value is or what gives them value. So if a parent just says, oh, you are so great because you always do the chores, the child then begins to think, my value comes from doing chores, If a parent says to the daughter, you are so pretty, and that's what they emphasize all the time, you are so pretty, you are going to be popular when you hit your teens with the guys, then the child says, my value comes from my body, from my beauty. So parents are, by how they treat the child, by what they say to the child, by what they validate the child for, parents are shaping the child's Value system, what they see is important, what they think gives them value, and how much value they have. There's a flip side to this. If a parent was to say, stop being so sensitive, now the child goes, ooh, sensitivity is a demerit. It is not a merit. It makes me have less value. Or if parents say, Stop crying so much. You're always crying. You're so sad all the time. Then they go, emotional sadness gives me less value. If I show that, 
I don't have value. So that is taking place. Positive validation, but negative validation. Then we go further. A child has a need to connect. They're driven to connect, to t- attach. And so if they connect with people because they're good at sports, because they're funny, because they're very pretty, then they go, that's what gives me value. The things that make it possible for me to connect. The ma- things that make people want to be my friend is what gives me value. Then you go further than that. The child is watching the family's value system. So what does dad see as what makes a person successful? So if dad's all about a big paycheck, a big place in a company, a big car, a big house, okay, that's my value system then. That's what is important in life is getting those things. So the family's value system becomes the child's belief system about what is valuable to make life happy and successful. And then we have a culture. So you have what's going on in the family as far as how the child is treated, the family's value system, the culture's value system. What does the culture teach makes me happy will lead to happiness. What does the culture teach will lead to me being successful. What does the culture value So what is on TV? Well, there's always pretty people that are getting on the commercials that are valued. There's rich people. There's athletes. Okay, then I must be smart. I must be pretty. I must have a good job. I must be very good at sports. Then I'll have great value. So a child is getting messages from all kinds of different sources that are gradually shaping its value system. And it forms within the child. Now, it can be a false value system. It could be a bunch of lies. But they're forming it and they're believing it if their parents are reinforcing it. So they can end up with lies about themselves. Lies about how to be happy. Lies about what success is. And they could value all the wrong things which will set them up for disappointment And many dark days. So. Let's look at this value system a little bit more. From the perspective of complex trauma. What happens for many children in complex trauma. Is parents don't make a distinction between who a child is and what a child does. And so if a child does something wrong. It's not just you did a wrong action but you're valuable. It's you're, you did a bad thing, so you're bad. And so the child begins to hear that if I do a bad thing, that gives, means I'm bad, which means I have less value. And then if nobody wants to connect with me, that must mean I have no value. And if I'm abused and neglected and abandoned, well, that must mean I have zero value or even negative value. And so what you can see is how a child is being treated in complex trauma is always producing a negative sense of value. And that is part of the, sh- the tragedy to me of complex trauma. And we call that shame, where you end up, instead of a positive sense of value, a positive identity, you end up with an identity that says, I have no value, I'm not lovable. I have negative value. Complex trauma creates a negative sense of value, but also it creates a wrong value system about what's important. And so what happens with the child is I don't have a a positive sense of value. I feel like a total loser. I feel like a nothing, but I want value. So how can I create value? How can I become more valuable? That's where the brain goes subconsciously. And so, okay, if I'm funny, people want to connect with me. Okay, funny makes me valuable. Funny is a valuable thing. So I must be seen as 
having value, but the only way I can get there is by performing. So I'll help people all the time, they validate me. I'm really pretty, they validate me. I'm funny, they validate me. Now what you end up with is a person that gains their value by what they do, not by who they are. And so that's why we say that complex trauma results not in human beings, but in human doers. They do in order to feel value, because they don't feel they have any value in being. So all of their sense of value comes from externals, not from their internal. The exact opposite of the way it should be. And that to me is what is so sad about complex trauma is it destroys value, but then it orients people to seek value in all the wrong places. And so... It can go to the extent for some children where if parents never validate them for doing good stuff, but only give them attention when they do bad stuff, they go, well, I got validated. I got my parents' attention. They connected with me for a little bit because I was bad. They never do that when I'm good. So now I will become a bad boy and gain my value from being bad because that will get me validation. It might not be the validation I truly desire, but it's better than no validation at all. And sadly, that is where some go. And then because you're looking for value in all the wrong places, Now you become afraid that life will change and you will lose those things that you're depending on for giving value. You get your value from doing your job. What happens when you retire? Then you go, now who am I? Do I have any value? Your value seems to be gone. You get your value from your beautiful body. But what happens when you get older and your body's not so beautiful? So when you get your value from the wrong things, it creates anxiety and insecurity that you're going to lose those things. So let me dig in this a bit deeper. So here's this child that has a negative sense of value. So they don't feel value, but they need to feel value. They don't feel value, but they long to be valued. So they now go on this unhealthy journey, an unhealthy approach to gaining value. I think this is what's happening subconsciously as they're trying to figure out how to gain value. So we feel value when we get validation or we even get attention. People notice us. We go, oh, okay, that that gives me value, okay? Or... Whatever causes people to respect me, then I think, okay, that's valuable. Whatever causes me to feel a sense of safety and security, I go, okay, that's valuable. Whatever meets my needs, I go, okay, that's valuable. Whatever gives me pleasure and makes me feel happy, I go, okay, that's valuable. And for some, whatever gets people to do what I want, well, that's got value too. So there's a whole bunch of factors that are part of what we're looking to as valuable, okay? So number one thing that people do is if my value comes from externals, let's find an externals arena that I have natural gifts and abilities in, and let's compete in that arena. So, again, the pretty girl. She goes, wow, all the guys notice me, want to date me. They notice me more than any of the other girls at school. This is my arena, my looks, my body, my beauty. So I now... That's the whole main source of what gives me value is my body. Or for some, they get a reputation that people want them because they're 
better at sex than anybody else in the school. They, and then they go, okay, I'm better in bed than anybody else. Okay, sex and being good at sex is what gives me my value. And that becomes their focus in developing that. Or certain careers get more respect than others. So I need to have that career in order to have value. I am good at getting money. I can compete in this arena. I can get more money than anybody else. I can have more possessions than others. I can win in this competition. Some can't compete in a lot of those arenas, but they compete compete in religion. So I keep the rules better than any other religious person. I jump through the hoops better than anybody else. I'm more spiritual because of what I do every day. So they try to compete in that. that. Some go, screw all that good stuff. I'm just going to be the baddest of the bad boys. I'm going to be the hardest drinker, do more crime, get in more fights, be more defiant, more mouthy, more intimidating. That's what's going to get me respect. But you see, with all of those, you're always at danger of losing the next time the competition takes place. There's always the danger of a prettier girl coming along, a smarter person, a better athlete. So you're always living with this insecurity. I got to keep proving I'm better than everybody. And it doesn't work, it creates greater anxiety. Part of what comes out of this one is some people gain their sense of value by comparing themselves with others. So what you'll notice with people like this, as soon as they meet somebody, they're looking for negatives in that person to prove they're better than that person. They're not looking to see the person accurately. They're looking for something that enables them to put that person down as being less than them. So there's always that comparison going on. Others go to a different tactic. And that is, I will gain value by rescuing people. So when people are in need or in trouble, I will rush in and help them and get them out of that. And then they will look up to me. So I will gain my value by helping. Others say, I will be a constant victim. I'll always be in need. Why? Because then I get validation. People come and say, poor you, let me help you. They give me attention. It's a reverse type of validation, but it gives me a sense of having value. And then others are just people pleasers. If I always do what you want, then you're going to like me. And then You're going to give me positive feedback and positive attention. And that'll make me feel value. Others go in a direction of the way I'm going to prove my value is I will be a perfectionist. I will do everything perfectly. That's what's going to give me value. And so they become this super responsible perfectionist, workaholic, high achiever, Go, go, go. Some go in the direction of, I'll get you to fear me. Because when you fear me, then you will respect me. So my respect, my value isn't based on good character. My value is based on you respecting me because you're afraid of me. And many go that direction. Another thing is people say, I can't clean up the internal part of my life, so I will create the perfect image. I'll be the best soccer mom who's got her kids involved in everything, has a clean house, clean yard. I'm involved in all kinds of different things. I will paint an image. And when we go out in public with the kids, we will be polite. We will treat each other super well so we're the perfect family in public. But behind closed doors, it's a disaster. But I will polish and work on my image so that people see me 
as a success, as a role model. They look at me with great respect. And some people can pull that off for years. It's not until they get into the stresses of life that cracks start to appear in their image and they can't quickly cover them over. So there's different approaches. And so if you come from complex trauma, I would expect that you have done at least one of those approaches to trying to get value. You may have done all of them, and that's okay. But it shows how deeply we long to be respected. But here's what I want you to understand. You don't respect yourself. That's the tragedy of complex trauma. It's not just that others didn't value you, but you come to not value yourself. So what you're trying to do is get others to value you, to respect you, so you feel better about yourself, but you haven't started respecting yourself. And so all of that positive respect from others feels good, but inside your inner critic is saying, but you're an imposter. If they knew what you're really like, they wouldn't respect you. And you stay not respecting yourself. And so eventually, all that positive respect doesn't work. It doesn't change how you really feel about yourself. But it becomes an addiction to pursue getting more and more validation. Now, let me move to try to explain this value thing a little bit more. I think there's five different types of value. Okay, so we're talking about value. So value, type number one, is inherent value. Why do we put people in jail for murder? Because all humans have inherent value. But then there's a second type of value, and it's the value of the position. So we treat a policeman with respect. They may not be a very wonderful person, but we treat them with respect because they got a badge. They're in a position of authority. We can treat parents with respect because of the position. So the, there's respect that goes with position. Then there's a third type of respect. When a person has skills and abilities where they're really good at something, we have a, a respect for them. Wow, they're an amazing athlete. They're an amazing musician. Wow, we respect that. Then we have respect for people who are just very loving and sacrificing and giving and helping out. And we look at that kind of service and that loving attitude and there's just a respect we have for those kind of people. But then there's character respect. I respect somebody because they are honest, they are faithful, they are kind, they set good boundaries, they're reliable. So when a person has character that I would say is good character, we see that as a merit. It adds to their respect. But there's also demerit character. So a person that lies, I lose respect for. A person that keeps breaking promises, I lose respect for. Okay, so seeing all of that, do you realize that you could have a person who's a corrupt police person, but they still have inherent value. They still have the value of the position. They still might be good at what they do, but they don't have good character and they're not loving. So you respect them in three areas, but in two areas, the most critical areas, you don't. And so it's very possible to have parents who they're your parents, they have inherent value, so they have the position, and they have inherent value, 
But man, they're terrible parents. They haven't been loving to you. They've been dishonest, disloyal. So you respect them, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that they don't earn your respect. And it's important to understand that distinction because I think a lot of people go, well, I'm supposed to respect my parents. Does that mean I just have to say whatever they do is perfect and I never confront them? I never say anything negative about them? I always just do what they want? No. You respect them because of their position and and the inherent value they have. But it doesn't mean you have to respect them in the other areas because they haven't earned that respect. And you need to set boundaries with that. And so it's very important to figure that out. Let me take it a bit further. I remember somebody once taking a brand new $20 bill, just freshly minted, not a wrinkle on it, clean, bright, shiny. And then they took a $20 bill that had been crumpled up in a ball for years in somebody's pants, and they held the two up, and they go, which one has more value? The beautiful, pristine Freshly minted $20 bill or the crumply one? Well, they both have the same value. So the external appearance doesn't determine their inherent value. A person who's been perfect almost in their life doesn't have more value than a person who's screwed up a lot. Inherently, we still have the same value. And so... That is important to understand. Then think of this. Think of a time before there were x-rays, doctors, biology, science, medical science. And you didn't know you had a heart. You didn't know the organs inside of you because nobody had ever seen them. Nobody had ever discovered them. So what I want you to see is your heart has great value, but you didn't even know about it. Did that mean your heart went around saying, oh, poor me, I have no value because nobody's validated me, because nobody's ever recognized me? No, it has great value whether it's noticed or not. And so it is possible to have great value and never have anybody validate it. And so the fact that your parents didn't validate you doesn't mean you didn't have value. It's just they were kind of mixed up and they didn't see your value. And so like the heart, you still had great value even though it wasn't recognized. Let me think of it. Have you think of another thing? Picture a bird versus a rabbit. They both go together to rabbit school. And part of rabbit school is learning to run fast. And so the bird and the rabbit get on the start line of a 100-yard dash, and they start running, and the rabbit gets to the other end very quickly, and the bird is just hardly hopping along. The rabbit might be able to say, wow, I'm way more valuable than you because I won this race. Well, the next day, both of them go to bird school. And the lesson today is to fly. And the bird takes off and flies beautifully and the rabbit can't get off the ground and stay off the ground. And the bird could say, wow, I'm way more valuable than you. That's not true. So what I want you to understand is when you start looking at people's abilities, don't think that makes them more valuable than you. Because If you were with them in a different context, in a context where their abilities didn't shine, but yours did, you would look a lot more valuable than them. So abilities do not determine true value. And then think of the President of the United States. When there's a war or great danger... Who is the person that is the highest priority to get to a place of safety? The president. Why? Because the welfare of the the country is connected to this one individual. So he is the greatest value to that country. 
He is the one that needs to get tons of resources to protect and keep alive. But does that mean the President of the United States is more valuable than everybody in the world? No. It's just within that organization. That's where his value is because of his role and his abilities. So again, your position within a company or organization does not determine your inherent, your core value. Hope that helps you just kind of think this through. So some people will say, well, why are you making a big deal about this? Yeah, I've been getting my value from the wrong things. I flirt all the time. I'm coy. What's the problem? Well, whenever you get value from the wrong things, eventually it doesn't work out very well. So what happens if you got your value from your image, from what you do, and you get into an intimate relationship, you're afraid to be authentic. You're afraid to connect because they would see the real you and they might see that you're not valuable. And so it prevents authenticity. It prevents connection, true connection, when you get your value from the wrong things. And then, like we said, it creates a fear that you're going to lose the things that gave you value. You're going to lose your money, your job, your looks. And so it creates greater insecurity, greater anxiety. And that is what leads some to a midlife crisis because they're starting to lose the things that gave them value. And now they go, now what? And they go through a time of crisis in their life. For some, once they start losing those things that give them value, the children move away and don't need them. They retire. They get sick. They lose their health. They get very depressed. Because now it feels they have no value. And it's a depressing place to be. Also, if you are looking at others to give you value by giving you respect, even though you don't respect yourself, you now become hypersensitive to them disrespecting you because they're saying you don't have value and that's going to trigger some deep wounds in you. Also, people that are looking to their value for externals, they stop growing because those are the things that are important, the externals, not the internal world. They don't see any value there or hope of getting value. So they're not working on developing and growing that. They're working on the externals and they stop growing. That means they now have scattered priorities. Oh, I got to keep my body in shape. Oh, I got to keep my image up. Oh, I got to get, get, get a new car because this one's getting old. And, and they're running around trying to prop up their house of cards that they are looking to to give them value and they can't focus on what truly matters. And that causes them to have difficulty setting goals. That causes them at times to go, what am I here for? I I, I don't feel I have any purpose. I'm tired of just going to work. I'm tired of a bigger car, more money in the bank. What's life really all about? And they begin to doubt and become disillusioned and question. And many start to shut off at that point because they don't want to get too honest about the fact that they built their life on a faulty foundation, on stuff that is sand that doesn't really matter or last. And it leads to kind of an internal crisis. But more than that, when you're focusing on getting your value from externals and neglecting your internal... You feel empty inside. You live with this discontent, this feeling of unfulfillment because your focus has been all out there. And then a person who's built all their value out there but doesn't respect themselves, they're a person that has difficulty standing up for themselves and setting boundaries. Because they don't respect themselves enough. They don't think they matter enough to set boundaries for. 
So what do we do to heal? It starts by respecting yourself. Not by trying to get others to respect you, but choosing to respect yourself. Now, i got to make a distinction here. A lot of people think out of their limbic brain, okay, I'll, I'll treat myself with respect when I feel respect for myself. The problem is you're never going to just one day wake up and go, oh, I feel respect for myself if you haven't been making changes and growing. So you have to basically go to your cortex and say, even though I don't feel any respect for myself, I know I have value. So I choose to treat myself with respect even though I don't feel I deserve it. And by choosing to treat yourself with respect, That helps you begin to gain respect for yourself. The next thing, which is very difficult, stop doing the things that you did to try and get value. So if you thought you had to be funny all the time, or you thought you had to be flirty all the time, or have a perfect body, don't go there. When you're with friends, try being serious. Try being authentic. Don't focus on just that you look great. Because as long as you keep putting energy into those things as your way of getting validation, it will hinder you from growing and healing internally. Now, the third thing I think is really important to think about. What happens in a child is they give mom and dad the greatest power, the greatest weight in their life. Naturally, it's built into a child. So what mom or dad says carries more weight with them than anybody else. So if mom says you're stupid, that impacts the child more than if anybody else said that they were stupid. Okay? So what I want you to understand is this. As an adult now, I can choose who I let have influence in me. I can choose who carries weight in my life. And so, mom and dad, if they're not healthy, I don't have to give them the weight that I used to give them. I can set boundaries. I can stop listening to them. And I can choose to bring into my life healthy, safe people and give them weight to influence how I think about myself and about life. So give careful thought to who carries the most weight in your life. And then if it's not healthy people, realize that you can change that. The next thing is give careful thought to what is a healthy value system. What leads to happiness? It's not money. It's not things. What, is the, what are the ingredients of true happiness? That's what I need to figure out so I can develop a good value system. What are the measures of true success? It's not my position in a company. It's not how much money I have in the bank. What marks true success? No kid looks at their dad and go, my dad's my hero because he's got lots of money in the bank. It's for totally different reasons that he values his dad. What are those things that are the measure of success? And then what are the character qualities that lead to merit respect, merit character? Think about those things. Next thing, understand this. You may have failed in the past greatly, and you might think that your failure has reduced your value even more. No, it hasn't. So forgive yourself for that. Quit trying to punish yourself. Forgive yourself. Learn from all of those mistakes and grow through that. Don't let that hold you back or keep you thinking you have no value. I think it's also helpful to ask yourself, what did my family consider as the recipe for happiness, the ingredients of happiness, the ingredients of success. What was my family's value system? Maybe it valued punctuality, neatness. And that was emphasized, drilled into you. 
Maybe they've emphasized good manners when you eat or when you're in public. Think through what your parents emphasized as important and wanted you to learn. Figure out their value system. And then, as you build new friendships, a new support system, make sure you choose people who value you not for what you do, but for who you are. That's the the support system you need, is people who respect you the way you're learning to respect yourself. This journey to a healthy value system, this journey to having a healthy sense of how much value I have, is so important. It is part of growing, getting healthy, healing from all the damage done. So I just hope this gives you some tools to help you on that journey. That's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break. Going to come back and do part two, which is the Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, not a problem. We're not going to be offended. Um, Free to go. For everybody that's going to stay, I'll be back in about a minute. Welcome back. We're looking at the life of Peter, and we're actually getting near the uh, end part of uh, this study that we've been doing for quite a while. And we come now to the events right after Jesus has gone back to heaven. And there's the 12 follow or 11, since Judas has committed suicide, but there's the 11 followers of Jesus, plus a few others who are left. And Jesus is gone. Let me just read, I want to read two events that happened. And have you think about Peter and the, what was going on inside of him in those two events? So in Acts 1, it says, during this time, just after Jesus went back to heaven, about 120 believers were together in one place. And we we're told they were praying together, trying to figure out what to do. So Peter stands up. He takes some leadership And he addresses the 120 and he says, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. And so he realized that Judas was actually predicted in the Old Testament through King David that he would be part of Jesus' ministry, but that he would betray him. And so now they understand those verses in Psalms about Judas. So they say, okay, all that happened as God said it would. So this was written in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, let someone else take his position. So we're going to, Jesus is gone. We're going to make the Bible now our guide. It's told us about Judas But it says that somebody should take his position once he's been exposed. So we must now choose a replacement for Judas. From among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with Jesus. From the time he was baptized until the day he was taken. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So bottom line it's saying Jesus chose 12 followers. Judas was one. He betrayed Jesus, committed suicide. Oh, we see now the Bible says that would happen. But it said we need to replace him so that there's going to be 12 leaders, 12 apostles. So what are the parameters? What are the conditions? Well, whoever we choose has to have been part of following Jesus from the time he started his public ministry, which is when he was baptized by John, his cousin, until the time he went back to heaven. 
So he has to know Jesus, have been part of following Jesus, listen to the teaching of Jesus. So that's going to be our condition. And so they talk about it and they end up picking somebody to replace Judas. Okay? But here's what I want you to think about. Up until then, Jesus had been the clear leader of the 12 or the 120 followers. He guided them. He taught them. He was their role model. He's gone. And so the question now is, who is going to provide leadership? Now, in the past, Peter, James, John... They would have said, me, pick me, pick me. I want to be the leader. I want to be the leader. And that's what they were all about. They were always scheming as to how they were going to be the top leaders in Jesus' organization when he becomes king. It was all about them. All about them having power. All about them being bigwigs. But what about now? Jesus is gone. Peter stands up, but it's a totally different attitude. I think what we see in Peter is Peter stands up and it's like, okay, somebody's got to take the lead here. I think I, I'll step in. I'm not gunning for it. If somebody else wants to do it, that's fine, but, but I'll, I'll start us off. So he's willing to lead, but there's been a change What we find now is in the past he wanted to lead and it was all about him. Putting himself on display. Getting respect from people. But now he's willing to lead but it's not about him. It's it's about we need to follow God and let God's word be our guide. So Jesus is still guiding us. I'm just kind of helping make it happen. And, And it's not about what I want now. It's about what God wants. About God's cause. It's not about me. There's been a change in his thinking. And so he's almost a reluctant leader. He's a leader now that Jesus was training him to be. A leader with the right motives. A leader with the humility necessary to be a great leader. A leader who was following God. They weren't independent. They were a follower too. So a true leader is also a follower of God, and Peter has become that. So let me take you to Acts 2. So this group is praying one day, 120 of them, and it says on the day of Pentecost, that's 50 days after the Passover, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together, the 120 in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. So like a tornado coming through. And if you've ever been around a tornado, you can hear it. And it filled the house with where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire settled on each one of them. And every one present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other language as the Spirit gave them ability. So one was now speaking Chinese, another English, another French. At that time, there were devout Jews in from every nation in the world coming to Jerusalem because the day of Pentecost was the day all Jewish men were to be present in Jerusalem for. So there was full of people from all over the world. And so when they hear the loud noise, they all come running to see what's what's wrong, what's going on. And they get there And they hear these people who are clearly from Israel speaking their language. And they were completely amazed and they go, how can this be? These people are all from Galilee. Galilee is kind of known as being the redneck part of the country. And yet we hear them speak our native languages. Languages they would never have learned in Galilee, but they're speaking it fluently. And so some are in amazement, but then others in the crowd, they start ridiculing and they go, oh, they're just drunk. That's why they're talking gibberish. 
They're not talking foreign languages. They're just a bunch of drunk people. Well, Peter, at this point, realizes this could go south. Because these people who are mocking and saying this, if that starts to spread, whatever God is doing right now is going to get explained away. It's going to be laughed at, minimized, denied. So if God's, whatever God's doing is going to happen, somebody needs to stand up and explain what's going on. So that these mockers don't win the day. And so Peter steps forward with the 11 other apostles. And he shouts to the crowd, listen carefully. All of you, fellow Jews, residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Now at that point in time, alcohol only had maybe 1% alcohol content. So you had to drink for a long time before you got drunk. And so Peter is saying it's impossible these people could be drunk at 9 in the morning. It's too early to be drunk. They haven't had enough time of drinking transpire yet. So he puts that crazy thought to bed and diffuses that. But do you see what just happened? Peter steps into leadership again, not to make himself look good, but to protect what God was doing. He stood before a crowd, not because he was gunning for it and wanting to it and trying to orchestrate it. No, he stepped before a crowd because if he didn't, some bad stuff would happen. Somebody had to step up. Now, here's the part I love. Do you realize that 50 days earlier, Peter had denied that he knew Jesus? Peter had failed. His greatest failure had taken place 50 days earlier, less than two months. He has come from denying that he knew Jesus. He has come from feeling like God could never use him again because he failed Jesus so deeply. And do you want to know what happened on that 50 days earlier? Peter reluctantly stands in front of this crowd and he says, somebody's got to tell the truth about what's happening here to protect what God's doing. And 5,000 people decided to follow Jesus that day as they listened to Peter. God took Peter still raw from failure, humbled by his failure, thinking he could never be used again, and said, Peter, I am going to make you so effective today that you're going to get a response from this audience greater than anybody's got before. I'm going to use you out of your greatest time of weakness and failure to be a great blessing to others. So, Peter, your value is not based on whether you failed or not. Your value is based on, you're my child, I made you. Now you're following me, and I'm just going to use you. And it's nothing to do with your great abilities. It's nothing to do with that you somehow convince people. It's just, I'm going to work through you, Peter, in your weakness to bless many others. And so I think Peter went home that day, not bragging, look at what I pulled off, but in absolute awe that God had used him so greatly after he had failed so deeply. And that is the greatness of God's grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story. Thank you that you changed Peter so he became a leader with the right motives and character, but also that you use Peter in a great way after such deep failure. Thank you for doing that in our lives as well. For your grace, we are so grateful. Amen. Well, that's the end of another Friday. It's just been a pleasure to share it with you. Look forward to seeing you next week.